Hello and welcome to the Vassals of Kingsgrave. We are back this time around to continue our ongoing reread of Harry Potter. In this, the eighth podcast, we will start reading The Goblet of Fire, the fourth book in the series, covering the first ten chapters of the book. My name is Zach, also known as Alias on the podcast of Ice and Fire Forums, and joining me we have... Hey, it's Casey, Blue-Eyed Queen on the forums. I'm Michal, Ink as Rain on the forums. This is Adam, Drown Snow on the forums. Matt, Farley on the forums. Abby, Daisy Warman on the forums. Excellent. Thank you all so much for joining me for this. So just a reminder for anyone listening that this podcast is full spoilers for everything in the Harry Potter universe, including the Cursed Child and the Fantastic Beast films. So before we get into the book and the chapters and everything, uh, we wanted to talk for a second about the latest wave of the banning of the Harry Potter books, which is something that's been happening for a long time, but we got this recently in the news again. Uh, Casey, do you want to take us through briefly what, what happened here? Sure. So um, just to give you the title, um, Harry Potter books removed from Catholic school library after priest rules the spells are real, could manifest evil spirits. Um, And that's basically the story. (laughs) Um, I just want to say that this never worked for me. So what the hell? Yeah, I'm kind yeah, of I'm actually pissed that. because I've been I, I exactly. I've been trying to use these spells for years and they don't work. So. Yeah, I have like a wand. Yeah, you're telling I me I just, just like, don't have the magic this priest pen. has. Yeah, Come on, not fair. Man, uh, anyone else super excited that he actually consulted exorcists in U.S. and Rome? How many exorcists are there? Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, there's that. a lot more than you would think uh, after listening to the last podcast on the Dude, last one. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. BuzzFeed did a, a video on exorcists. No, but actually, like, it's Roman just, Catholic yeah, exorcists. Like, there's a, those people that fuck snakes and, like, you know, take away evil spirits. And, what? But I'm talking, like, what? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> remember, back remember up, back up. You, you always <laughs> need a young priest and an old priest. So yes. that kind of expands it. And then in the sequel, <laughs> the young priest. Only be two. <laughs> a master and an apprentice. No more, no less. It's weird that. Jude Law is both the Pope and and Dumbledore at the same time. It's crazy. Ooh. Well, the reason that I always find these things hilarious is that these books are very like Christian centric. Am I am I wrong in saying that, or well, like Harry especially Potter's at the end? Jesus figure. Yeah, yeah. Like, he gives his life to save everyone. I uh, I mean like but like you could say that anyone uh, that uh, self sacrifice would be a Jesus allegory. Then I don't really yes, think that's you what could. you're going for. I mean, you know. I thought it was more that, like, Hogwarts is based around, like, a Catholic school system, kind of, because they get, like, all the Christmas and Easter stuff, and, like... <laughs> but isn't that just, like, very, like, British school? I don't know. I'm not yeah, British. It's very, it's very Church of England. It's very, like, like in- England is a is a Christian country. Like, they function yeah. under Christian days and holidays. Um, so, it may... So, you know, like, I don't... I don't think that the right like we have Christmas is especially religious books. but like that is the structure that they work under and like it's an interesting thing of like well why don't they you know kind of question that and then it's like well we're doing like a normal boarding school thing which is what it would be like so i don't know do wizards believe in god though that's the question they never they make mention to it they don't believe yeah, there's nothing in, like that ever covered like dressing normally <laughs> So what they believe so what in they, is of what no they interest do, to me. What is their what is their mythology around Christmas? I I think it's just like a <laughs> cultural thing because they don't, is it? I might be like they confused, definitely think. don't go to mass. They definitely yeah. like there aren't school wide like religious services. Dumbledore's funeral is not religious in any way. It's it's I I agree. I think it's definitely like a cultural. Um, so it's like Christmas in America. It's just about the presents. <laughs> Yeah, it's all capitalism. But yeah, did, like if the, if you asked the wizard about Christmas, would they just be like, "That's when we get presents"? What's it like? They wouldn't even know about Santa Claus because they also go home for Easter. <laughs> no, though, they call too. Them Father Christmas. To me, it seems like it's the books are written, and I like I don't blame J.K. necessarily for this, but it seems like the books are written in a way that like you should assume that like they're celebrating Christmas because they're Christian. It kind of I feel like a lot of books were people do this where like I, I feel like I even did this as a kid like I didn't know what like other religions were so I was like oh yeah everybody celebrates Christmas or whatever so yeah I don't know it's just funny to me because like they do go home for Easter but you never see them like doing anything I mean I don't really know what you do on Easter but like 
they get Easter off and they um something about although, eggs. Think, yeah. <laughs> they all go hunt eggs. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Does it like, seem weird that they follow all of these muggle dates, but they're so disconnected from the muggle world, like they hardly know like what like plumbing and shit is, you know? Well, I think maybe uh, if we wanted to look at it, you could see that uh, most of these holidays are just appropriated from pagan holidays, celebrating the solstices and stuff. So yeah. maybe that, maybe that's why they kind of right. like well, it. Well, they do Halloween, which is like the Sa- Samahan or something, right? And that's like the Same big year. holiday. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's a Druid holiday, though. But there's also like All Hallows Eve and there's a bunch of different things around yeah that wouldn't definitely make sense but you'd think they'd have more of like their own invented holidays but maybe that's just for our benefit yeah like harry potter day (laughs) yeah that's right like Like i think they would actually have that with how famous he is no yeah and actually don't they have that in cursed child isn't there a harry potter day um i mean yeah there should be there should be everyone knows the big wizarding events are september 1st and Harry Potter Day, and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just too bad, right? I, I really feel yeah. like getting a chance to to read these books as a kid really helped just get me interested in reading in general and everything else. And just, it, I don't know, like, they're so accessible and good, it's too bad that kids just don't get to don't get yeah, it'd be, for these I, reasons. It'd be interesting to see what books are allowed and what other ones are banned to see if they, you know, they're really trying to guide their... Um, thinking towards a specific, you know, conservative, like, do they want to do conservative Catholic or do they just want to, you know, not do Harry Potter? I mean, this is in, um, I should say that this is in Tennessee. Um, so it is a little not metropole. Of course Not cosmopolitan. Yeah, whatever. (laughs) And it is kind of ironic, like for me, in my life, like Dumbledore, or you could say J.K. Rowling, like has one of the most compelling arguments, kind of for believing in something, in some of the things that he says. So it's kind of weird, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so it is. All right. Yeah. So before we get into the chapters, also I wanted to kind of just check since we're on the fourth book now. I'm curious, like, where do you guys rank this book, uh, *Goblet of Fire*, among the Harry Potter books? Does it have oh, any kind one. of? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, number one. So make the case. I'm just curious. What What do you love so much about this one? Um, I don't know. I just feel like it expands the world so much. It gives you like the perspective that goes beyond the school and it makes it more um, just like I like the world building in a lot. I like that you see that there's other wizarding cultures and like other schools and stuff. And I just think that um, this is when the plot starts to get actually serious because this is when Voldemort comes back. So um, the other books you kind of I mean, the last book, there was no Voldemort at all. And then the other ones are you kind of have a shadow of him. But this is when it actually starts to establish that, like, there is a reason that Harry is special. And um, it just builds on the whole, like, and this is where the plot takes off. And I also just, I love the world building in a lot. I'd say the plot was pretty serious in the last book. Just so. Oh, <laughs> serious? Oh. Oh. All right. <laughs> Boo. Yeah. I agree with the... Uh, Everything Abby just said, and I think it, this is where it stops really being a kids series and opens up. You know, this is like the empire of the uh, of the book series. Yeah, it's true. It really it represents a pretty dramatic step up. I think in in the series. I think for me, I just think the books get better and better for the most part. Um, I, and I think that this book is really where that that ramping up effect happens dramatically. So I agree, and I think as you said, Abby, the world building also just expands a ton, and you get to see so much more of the world, which is which is great. Yeah, no, it, either this one or the sixth book are my favorite. I, I want to like make a, another determination after this reread, but um, between those two, there's just so much. I don't know. There's so much introspection, and there's so much like new new things that we hadn't really learned about like with the fourth book it's just like even in these chapters you as abby was saying like the different cultures like the americans were gossiping on their campsite and all that it was like kind of real it was really funny and it was nice Alrighty, so let's go ahead and jump into the chapters here starting with the first two chapters of the book chapter one and two the riddle house and the scar and i believe that michal will be taking us through these yeah so um there's a lot to talk about in the Riddle House, and in my opinion, very little to talk about yeah. in the Scar. Um, <laughs> so I kind of lucked out with that. But um, 
yeah, I mean, the, the Riddle House is one of my favorite chapters in Harry Potter. I adore it when J.K. Rowling goes back to this third-person omniscient voice. Um, I think she almost always, like, carries it off so beautifully, and we haven't actually seen her do it since the very first chapter of the first book. Um, With Vernon Dursley, so, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and you get, and she's, she's, you know, ironically for a book that's all about wizards, like she's so great at writing muggles. And I specifically say muggles because there is like always that contrast to the wizarding world when she's writing, you know, normal people. Um, but I, I think, so, I mean, I, I guess a brief rundown, um, this is, you know, the first week inkling we kind of get of Voldemort's history, um, in, you know, the village of Little Hingleton, um, the, uh, the Riddle family is murdered one night and their groundskeeper, Frank, is accused of the murder, uh, except that they realize that they have not apparently been killed by anything. So Frank gets off and 50 years pass. He lives in suspicion, taking care of the house. And then he, um, one night wakes up to find, um, a fire in the house and goes to investigate and discovers that there is a there are two wizards in the house namely Lord Voldemort and Peter Pettigrew uh, and, and a snake uh, which is significant um, and they talk about murder and plans and why they have to wait till the end of a school year to carry out their evil plan um, which is my main problem with this chapter um, <laughs> And then um, they find Frank and they murder him. Um, And then in the next chapter, basically, Harry wakes up, remembers his dream, and writes to Sirius about it. The end. Um, So, so justice for Frank. I know. I know. It feels so bad. I think this might be the first time we've actually experienced Voldemort murdering someone, which is interesting. Well, I think it's the first murder we see in the Mm. whole series, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of, like, it, it's really dark, and it kind of, like, sets you up for, like, the book being more dark and more adult, or young adult. New adult, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not new adult. <laughs> no, too, bad. <laughs> too bad. Yeah, I mean, I just feel so bad for Frank. Like, just the way that she renders him in just a few pages, you really do feel, not even just him dying, but just his life. It just feels bad. Like, the kids mocking him and him being in constant suspicion by the whole village. Yeah, and it's all ex- life. and it's all external forces that fucked up his life. Like he went to war, he got came back with like PTSD. Then he gets like blamed for these murders, and then yeah, he has to live under suspicion his entire life while he's still just trying to garden. Man, all he wants to do is keep the grounds nice. He's doing his well, job. He's like he's such a vulnerable character. Like I I love the scene when they're all like you know, I, and this is something that I think you know I didn't love the casual vacancy. It's definitely not a book that I've ever reread or plan to reread, but there is something about small town English life that she is so yep. keyed into and like the hypocrisy of the way people live there. Um, and, you know, so all these people are like all oh, friends and they're all hanging out at the village pub. And then they're like out of nowhere, they're immediately like, Oh, I never liked him. He was terrible. I knew he's a murderer, you know? Um, and th- that, you know, groundless accusation like right like destroys his life follows him for the rest of his life and it's also you know from a from a literary perspective super ironic that the person who kills who actually uh you know committed those murders is the person who ends up killing frank in the end but um yeah i think there's there's something you know the way the way somebody in the in the pub says that he had a hard war and at you know the very end of his life frank says that, you know, now that the time had come for action, he felt braver and it had always been so in the war. And there's there's just something so, like, lived about this guy. And, mm, yeah. like, I think it's it's really rewarding when we do see him come back extremely briefly at the end, though. But we, we, we still feel that, like, oh, that's him. And, like, we know who he is. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's also interesting that this, this chapter connects to some of the most... Um, powerful stuff in book six in my opinion which is obviously you know Voldemort's backstory I think these are the murders that Voldemort uses to make the ring the horcrux is that I think so yeah and then he goes back to um um what's it called the gaunt house and um 
and hides the ring in the ruins. And that might be when he bewitches Marvolo. I don't remember. And these riddles are like his his, his, father, his biological yeah. father and yep. um, his family, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So do you think he, like they say that they died with a look of terror. Do you think he actually did some spell to scare them to death or did he do the killing spell? Because I thought the killing spell just, like, knocked you whatever you're doing. Isn't it like his dad abandoned him, right, once he found out the mom was a witch? So the family's probably pretty well, scared of magic. Dalton. Yeah, that yeah. too. Yeah. I, um, so that the is family's a hashtag probably, complicated situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. But the family's probably terrified of magic, so it makes sense that they, like, this teenager shows up, he's got a wand, he's probably looks pretty menacing, you know? I I actually, to laugh at him. Like if some teenager busts through my door with a wand, like but they get the know. fuck out of here, kid. They they know though, that's the thing. Right? Well, they, Tom does. They, they, no. I don't I think, think the grandparents the, the thing is though, I I mean, this is just me and I'm making this up, but but I imagine this very much as a like I don't think this was a short conversation. No, I don't, he tells yeah, them the whole exactly. story. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I'm sure he did plenty of magic to scare the shit out of them before he did AK on them. Um, I th- I have to assume he did AK because that's. Yeah, I mean, no traces of anything yeah, else. Yeah, this it's is just the book we find out about it, and you know, it, it just kind of fits. Um, and the idea of like that being a spell that leaves a mark. I I kind of think of this more like you know we get that information back in book two that Tom Riddle in Hogwarts was actually very like, um, fuck, what's the word? Charismatic. Yeah, charismatic. That's what I'm thinking of. Sorry. So (laughs) I think that maybe he somehow like introduced himself and then like eventually, like as Michal was saying, like some kind of, he he told him like basically like, I'm your son and I've murdered all these people and it's all because of you, blah, 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 murdered them. Had he murdered all those people yet though? I thought these were like his first kills. So this isn't the first time that he's killed because we know that obviously Myrtle died. Um, but this is this might be the first time he like actually used his wand to kill. Probably not, but maybe. Well, Myrtle died from the from the basilisk, right? But that was because of him. Yeah, but come on, accessory to murder. Yeah, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> In a it's just system. a manslaughter violation, second degree. <laughs> yeah, so. You know, other other than like the crazy love that I have for um, Frank and the writing in this chapter, we do definitely get like some groundwork of you know, like here's what Voldemort's planning, and not exactly, but you know the the like basically Voldemort's planning something, and I never actually know if it really adds up if like his hints about like we have to wait until after the Quidditch World Cup and then. Um, you know, I'm determined because, um, you know, I can't use another wizard and we only have one more murder. They keep talking about one more murder. And I'm like, who's that murder? Is the murder Mad-Eye or is the murder murder Crouch? Or is it like... It's Harry. No, but they're talking about one more murder and then the path to Harry will be clear. Um, Dumbledore? Cedric? (laughs) It's basically whoever, like gets into the port key, right? But no, they don't know that Cedric's gonna come to the port key. Yeah, that's what kind of makes the end of this book so great that like Kill Cedric has to die. <laughs> yeah. Just pure cruelty motivating that. Yeah, I yeah. think it would have to be Mad Eye or just like someone to plant uh Bertie Crouch Jr. in the school. Like something yeah. like that. Yeah. I have a question that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Is that okay? Cool. <laughs> Who w- was paying Frank <laughs> To upkeep the house. Yeah, that, that the, the rich dude that owned the manor for it. tax purposes. Yeah, but who was that? I, I want to know. I don't know. I, I thought he was just some... living off like a war pension or something. No, but there was like a who owned who owned the the manor though for tax purposes. I'm guessing. I don't think, someone I don't think related. It was though, I think it was someone like, related too. Yeah, it's probably some Russian oligarch. Bellatrix is <laughs> Igor Karkov. <laughs> Malfoy. <laughs> Wait, no, he's Bulgarian. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That's maybe it's Dumbledore. What? Maybe. Maybe, maybe Dumbledore is like, I know this house is significant for some reason, so. He owns it through a shell company. Just yeah. <laughs> Dumblecore. I have a much more 
I have a much more important question. How do you milk a snake? <laughs> yeah, the venom. It's the venom. So I might no, should, should I maybe I should ask Paul. He could probably No, you milk the venom. <laughs> you you can milk the venom from its fangs. No. That's like a thing people do. You never do. milk a snake, bro? No, yeah, no. I know that you can do that, but like, I think that they were literally meaning like milk the snake, like for sustenance. Oh. I don't think that's possible because snakes don't Is have nipples. Is that a thing? Yeah, snakes yeah. don't have nipples. You can't milk them. Yeah, that's true. How do they yeah, feed the baby can. snakes? They're in eggs and they eat their eggshell and then yeah. they go off on their, their own. Their nipples, you know, to Some are born alive, something. like those um, pythons in the Everglades. Huh? How about that? <laughs> wow. They have a yolk sack Learn still. <laughs> All right, well, I actually we watch the, I actually watch uh, snake stuff on YouTube sometimes. It's weird. Bye. Um. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was listening to a podcast about snakes. It was pretty cool. I learned about a lot. Okay. <laughs> learned the difference between poison and venom. Well, it is interesting that the venom is because I, I, I that's that's my camp. I'm definitely saying I definitely think that it's the venom that they're talking about yeah, um, that's used to keep Voldemort alive. Yeah, which... he's literally sustained by venom. Maybe yeah. that's why he looks like a snake. <laughs> Maybe. <Yep. laughs> I'm the snake. Also, all I can think about when like he's sitting in the chair is that episode of Spongebob where he wants to sell the chocolate. Oh, yeah, like, that, that old lady. That really old, <laughs> old thing. That's what I like picture he looks like. I, I can see it. I don't know this reference. I don't know that either. Me neither. Uh, oh my gosh. I, oh, oh my god, god, I'm in the old club. A bunch of boomers <laughs> on this chat. Babies of the podcast, elucidate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do SpongeBob later. All right. Yeah, I think on the scar side of things, the most notable thing to take away from that, of course, is the fact that Harry is, for the first time, I think, literally seeing inside Voldemort's head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, think, I think that yep. we actually get the context for that. So it, do you think that uh, Rowling had the Horcruxes figured out at this point? I think by now she had to have because there's so many like foreshadowing clues in there about this whole thing that will come to fruition in book six that I don't think she could have not had some of it planned out by this point. Yeah, she's dropping hints that are like are in this book that happened in a couple books away. I think the pensive, the whole pensive thing. I think that's. I don't necessarily know if she like knew they're called Horcruxes exactly, but I think she knew that like. Voldemort's doing something like there was always something about the fraction of his soul that like managed to cling on to Harry. So, yeah. Well, isn't she the type of author who like plans the entire book out though? Didn't she? I forget. Yeah. The, there was like a paper, not a paper, like an article about that once or something that I read. Like she had most of it planned out. I think. She's I think she had the Snape thing uh, planned out from the beginning. I think like any author, she there are definitely overarching things that she worked with and had in mind and then there are other things that you know fell into place really nicely and then there are things like you know the medi wizards that are referred to as medi wizards in this book and healers in the next book so well, i think you, you become a healer with seven years of study you start as a meta wizard and that's really <laughs> I, thought the med, I thought the meta wizards it's a different were classification the nurses. yeah i thought meta wizards were nurses and healers were doctors but <laughs> maybe maybe i thought meta Meta, whatever is, or like uh, EMTs, paramedics. That's what I thought. So, yeah. uh, first responders on the scene, and then they bring them to the hospital. Yeah. We, we, we do get, on a more important note, um, we do get a, <laughs> uh, an, an indication of um, occlumency and legitimacy mm, in the yeah. first chapter because he's. His mind. Yeah, he says, Nobody knows you're here. You have no wife. Don't lie to Lord Voldemort. He always knows. And I, I think that's definitely her being like, there's more to his ability to suss out people's, the realities of people's lives than just like guesswork. And and the way that he says it, Lord Voldemort always knows, is obviously meant to kind of contribute to his myth and the fear factor that he just always knows everything about everyone. and You can't hide secrets from him. Yeah. Alrighty, let's go ahead and hit up chapters three, four, and five, which are the invitation back to the burrow and Weasley's wizard wheezes, which Casey will be taking us through. Yeah, so this these three chapters were pretty much like comic relief for me. Um, yeah. The the like one sentence summary I have is um, the Weasleys come to rescue Harry. Dudley gets a tongue twisting surprise. Fred and George are starting their own business, and Harry joins the Weasleys for an exciting dinner. All right, so first scene where where Mr. Weasley, Ron, Fred, and George all come down the chimney together was so comical in that like 
I don't understand why, like, all of them needed to go to the Dursleys only, like, except introducing wizard wheezes for Dudley. I, I'm, my headcanon, and this is just me making, making it up, uh, is that Mrs. Weasley was like, please get the boys out of my fucking hair. (laughs) Yeah. Because why? They're feral. That's why. (laughs) <laughs> She's like, get these fucking kids away for like two seconds. I'm okay, the twins might be feral. The rest of them aren't feral. It's called They're, free range. Bill will be feral later. <laughs> it's called <Yeah>. free range. <laughs> so uh, we get our first like introduction here of wizard wheezes. Um, and so I think my only question is like, how is this not doing magic in like the in the school sense? Um, them creating these wizard wheezes, or is there some like exception for food and potion making here. Um, I don't. But think potion making requires magic, technically. And I also think that uh, in the household they leave it up to the parents to enforce magic use or not, because the only reason they can detect Harry is because he's in with a bunch of Muggles, so he's the only person in the house that could do magic. Yeah, it's like Hermione uses. I her might wand. be wrong. No, Hermione uses her wand in the um, in one of my chapters, and like it doesn't matter because she's surrounded by a bunch of wizards, so they wouldn't be able to know who did it. But also, like that was like an emergency. Yeah, well, it was an emergency when Harry fought off those Dementors in the next book, but they don't care. Well, they're trying to frame him. Was- yeah, no, that was because uh, what's her face was that was all thing. politics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually do think that Fred and George might have made at least the bulk of their innovations on this during the school year, though, because they talk about, like, later working on it for six months, and Molly attributes their lack of owls to that. um, But, like, they're (laughs) they're also making explosions and stuff from their room, so. That's true. I want to talk a sec about Mr. Weasley. Just like every teenage boy. (laughs) All kinds of explosions happening. I love um, Mr. Weasley so much. He has his ups and downs in these chapters. He has some bad looks later, but he's it's so good here. It's you're very proud of him when he really stands up to the Dursleys, and he's really the first person I think who who mm-hmm. kind of stands up for Harry in front of the Dursleys. It happens more later, but he's really the first one to do that. Yeah, I was so taken aback by Mr. Weasley's like defiant, not defiance, like like subtle like. Hint, hint, this is your adopted child. Why are you not upset that he's leaving? Or, like, why don't you want to say goodbye to him? And, like, all that stuff, like, like kind of, like, side-eyeing, saying, like, you guys suck at this parenting thing. Um, and to me, I, I forgot that that all, that this happened. I think I also am very, like, partial to Sirius being more of a father figure to Harry. So I think I forget, like, how much Mr. Weasley is a part of that. Just a good guy. He makes mistakes, yeah. but he's a good guy. I was kind of, like, annoyed, though, when he just, like, blew out their fireplace. I was like, you can't fix that. You don't know how to fix that. You just destroyed their fireplace. No, he does a masonry <laughs> charm and fucking fixes it. That's but fine. it has electricity. I thought magic can't work with electricity. His can, because he loves it so much. He knows what a plug <laughs> does. I'm also a little concerned how easy it is for someone just to request, can I have flu access to Harry Potter's house, please? Thank you. Oh, the ministry is corrupt. <laughs> and not have before. Yeah. Harry doesn't even know. He doesn't even yes, know about it's it. not for Voldemort at all. <laughs> well, we're getting into the, all the ridiculousness of the ministry, and these chapters are really getting a sense of so the, the mess that is that organization. I think uh, it's funny, like, I felt this almost sense of relief that things kind of don't go horribly wrong for Harry with the Dursleys this year. Obviously, things kind of go horribly wrong for Arthur Weasley having to deal with them <laughs> at the end here. But this is the first time that like Harry doesn't have to deal with a lot of shit from the Dursleys in, in a summer. And yet, this is the first time that things kind of go really bad for him in the school year. So it's kind of a, a reversal that's almost mm-hmm. happening there. Yeah, but we don't see too much time off screen with him. Like, we're not, we don't have the chance to see all the abuse that he got. Yeah, it sounds like he has more control of the situation just because he has the threat of Sirius looming. Yeah. He's not, not getting as abused as much. I do want to ask, though, this is actually maybe the most horrifying thing in the chapter. Eating birthday cakes that you're just sitting under the floorboards for weeks. Oh, I know. I like, know. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> stale, and he even mentions, like, in the next chapter, like, I was eating stale cake for weeks. <laughs> it's like, like, ew. What? <laughs> do you I'll think maybe. Grapefruit. 
Yeah, do you think that maybe uh, cakes in England or something else, like, you know, pudding refers to, like, all dessert? I maybe think a cakes birthday are... cake. Yeah, I birthday, think a birthday cake. cake is a birthday cake. Yeah. I yeah. think that it could I mean, be, it, like, it might have not had icing. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, it's not I, like where they talk about biscuits and they just mean crackers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I imagine, like, the Weasleys one had, like, a stasis charm or something on it. A stasis charm? Sure, 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 why, sure, why not? It, to keep it fresh. <laughs> Yeah, I thought you could do that. Where Preservativo. Like, yeah, make my food fresh. <laughs> yeah. Asio citric acid. <laughs> Whereas, like, I, mean, I do have to say, like, in reaction to this, I did make myself brownies that were very fresh and very good. So I can't, I thank can't you, imagine Harry Potter. Her, I can't imagine Hermione's cake tasted very good, though. Isn't she like not good at cooking? <laughs> No, I don't. I, I, well, I don't remember. Sure I just know that she bought one from a shop. It's all sugar-free. <laughs> like, isn't it all like sugar-free <laughs> stuff? Because it's dentist. Yeah, yeah so it'd be pretty gross. Yeah. Stuff with fluoride. <laughs> <laughs> with all the, with also with these chapters, we get this really nice dinner scene where like Harry just gets to experience like a normal family having like normal family talk, and like so much, so many good like. Molly Weasley mom moments in this chap mm, yeah. in these chapters as well. Like, Bill, why do you have an earring? You should not have an earring. And why won't you let me cut your hair? And it like it seems like she could just cut his hair like with the wand. I think mm-hmm. um, is really funny to me. <laughs> it's just hilarious that like she's like, oh, I would only take off the little. It's like absolutely not. She would a hundred percent give him like give an army cut, and you know. <laughs> yeah. Look yeah, I think that way. yeah, I really love all the weekly well, cool. characterizations and stuff yes. that they all get. Yeah, it's kind of fun to see how your perspective on these books changes over time. Like when I was a kid, I would never have thought about this, but at at this point in my life, I kind of empathize a lot with Fred and George's desire to blaze yeah. their own career path. You know? <laughs> and, and also, and also Percy's Percy's attempts to, at making his shitty entry level job. Like, at this big institution, <laughs> see more important. I actually kind of feel that as well. <laughs> okay, yeah, I sympathize with Percy so much in these, like, before he becomes, like, an actual douchebag leader, when everyone just is ripping on him because he's just trying to work his way up the ladder and, like, everyone Those is so mean to him. <laughs> yeah, and I'm yeah. just like, I feel so bad for him. Yeah, it's funny. I don't understand, though, why Molly wouldn't support Fred and George starting their own small business and... Well, making it I mean, big the, I, I think i get it it's the it's the typical it's the parenting. mom worry well yeah, yeah you don't want them to do something that obviously will lead to not them not being able to have a life you know so i yeah. get it and i think as i get older i'll probably sympathize more with mrs weasley i think you know as sure. you to read the books and your perspective changes so that is something to, to or mr cool weasley about. i don't know which path i'm gonna go <laughs> calm and collected or anxiety <laughs> wasn't there a moment where um I, I related to Hermione so much it was like everyone was oh, laughing yeah. about like yeah. the tables in the air and Hermione was like teetering on amusement and anxiety yeah. and I was, that, that line that <laughs> line 100%. is 100 percent yep <laughs> that's dude <laughs> yeah exactly as the kids say I actually had this written down as the kids say that is a mood <laughs> <laughs> that is what I would say <laughs> I also, I feel like I've had this kind of sports conversation about Crum in Ireland that they have at dinner a thousand times. Like, yeah. Oh, the Ireland team's better, but they've got Crum. They've got him. He's, he's the best. Oh, is that like, oh yeah, we got Tom Brady. We got Tom Brady. We got Tom yeah. Brady. And sure. With... <laughs> I'm sorry. I think uh, we've talked about this before. And, we, and it's kind of this idea, again, about Fred and George kind of trying to start their small business. But how many legit career options are there in the wizarding world? We, we actually get a lot of jobs in these chapters, but it still feels like there's not much. You can work for the ministry. You, you can, can be a wizard. Or... Yeah. yeah, you can own a shop, work for the ministry in some sense, like some type of job, like being a teacher or something. Or you can be a sports player. Or you yeah. can or just gossip with sports. the Americans. Yeah, I mean, the labor seems to be taken up by first magic and then magical creatures that they enslave, so. And muggles. Right, and low-key muggles that don't know what's going on. And, you know, maybe occasionally you brainwash one to clean your house. I don't know. Merry Christmas. (laughs) Uh, We'll we'll get to that in a second. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, that's my chapter. Calm yourself. Sorry. Stay stay in your lane. Shit's gonna get real. 
Alrighty, let's hit chapters 6, 7, and 8. The Port Key, Bagman and Crouch, and the Quidditch World Cup, which I believe is Varley. Yeah, I got these. All right, so the port key, we learn about the new magical thing that will play a role later on in the book like we do in every book. Uh, the port key helps transport wizards that can't apparate or use a broom. So uh, we learn that uh, the young guys are going to wake up early and hike it to get to the port key, and the older kids are going to apparate later, and so they get to stay in bed. Uh, the Weasleys, Harry, and Hermione meet Batman and his asshole father, and they touch the boot and are <laughs> transported to the Quidditch World Cup final. Uh, then the next one is Bagman and Crouch, and this is, whoa, we get to see a lot of the Wizarding World. Uh, props to the Salem Witches that made it over to England for the World Cup, representing, North, in, you know, New England, United States. Such a good uh, joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then we get to meet a couple big wigs in the ministry, Ludo Bagman, who I never really, like, had a good read on before, but I think I'm starting to like him. I think he's just, like, a interesting dumb, happy guy that, like, lets his enthusiasm, you know, get the better of him at some points. He's also a thief. Yeah. yeah and yeah, a but degenerate gambler. And, hey, you know. you know, we all have... If, if that's the worst... You know, look, as we grow older, we identify with different people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> true that, true that. <laughs> so, for some reason, uh, Hermione, Ron, and uh, Harry need to go get water manually. I don't know why they just can't use a spell. Um, but they get to see all this, uh, all the different wizards and their setups, and they have weather vanes on tents and gardens and shit like that. It's pretty cool. Um, gotta gotta and, show off for each other. Yeah. Uh, and then, do you guys yeah. know the theory that the uh, tent with the peacocks tethered outside is the Malfoy tent? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, is that what? because they're like uh, half blood prints? They see peacocks, and the guys like, oh, the Malfoys are always overdid it for themselves or something. Yeah, I think that's definitely Hallows, but yeah, they definitely have peacocks. <laughs> yeah, they keep peacocks in their house, but peacocks it's, are assholes. It's, I think it's like a really British thing to like have peacocks like around like stately houses though or something because apparently I mean, I've never been to England but I have heard that lots of like manor houses have peacocks for some reason. Uh, we get to meet Barty Crouch, uh, Percy's boss, who doesn't know Percy's name. That's pretty funny. Um, and then they buy a bunch of weird souvenirs and there's those that weird rich poor dynamic between harry and ron that we get to revisit and make it super awkward and then we go to the quidditch world cup and this entire chapter can be scrapped except for the kind of reintroduction of the malfoys and the introduction of winky a new house elf who of course harry mistakes for dobby the only other house elf that he's ever seen so he only figures that there's one in the entire world and he's met him again but no it's a different house elf um, and then for some reason we get a fucking play by play of the entire Quidditch World Cup completely unnecessary no one gives a fuck but then we find out that uh, Crumb you know wants to d finish it his way so he gets a snitch after doing the fucking faint or whatever and knocks the other guy out and then uh, yeah so Ireland wins and the leprechauns go wild I'm glad I'm not uh, the only one that just skipped over all of the Quidditch commentary, mostly. Really? It's funny, because, like, I remember when I read this first, I was so into it. Like, I yeah. was so excited about the spectacle of the match. And, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of... Quidditch is, is Quidditch, you know? Uh, it's it's pretty straightforward, and it, there's only so many ways to make it interesting, as we've seen it. But I, I still enjoy it. I think just the spectacle of the event and feeling what Harry's feeling and how excited he is about it, I like it. I don't know. I still enjoy it. I liked it just because, like, it's, like, the same feeling that I remember having when I went to, like, my first, uh, my first, like, sporting event was, like, a Yankee game. And just, like, Ew. feeling so excited and, like, seeing yeah, all the players and, like, in person and winning the game and, you know, just all that excitement. And I think it's kind of funny that being in the top box is actually, like, the best scene. Yeah. In the nose, please. Well, because Quidditch is in the air, right? So it actually makes sense. Yeah, yeah if, unless you rem remember the movie, and then they were like, the top seats are the worst seats. These are all these are all the seats that the Weasleys could afford, or something like that. They completely changed that for some reason. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> so weird. There's a couple more Mr. Weasley highlights in these chapters. We get him accidentally dressing up as the ultimate muggle dad. I think he really nailed that <laughs> by accident. With the golf sweater and the big jeans and stuff. I love he it. He just needed some like new balances and he'd be good. I hope he tucked in the polo. Oh, I'm sure he did. Yeah. Also, just getting overexcited about using the mallet and the matches and stuff. Just mm-hmm. the best stuff. I have a question because I don't remember this. What, why wasn't um, Barty Crouch at the game? Like, why was Winky holding his seat the whole time when he never, like, what was the reason he didn't show up? Well, we know we know later that Winky actually is not holding the seat for Barty Crouch. Oh, he's Barty sitting Crouch next to Barty Crouch Junior. <laughs> okay, see, I I couldn't remember what it was. Is she she's imperious to the end, right? Is that what it is? No, she's she's in her right mind. I think. Okay. I think like she was probably just told like, say that you're holding the seat for me or for whoever. Okay. Right, because he Barty Crouch sent them to the game because Barty Crouch Junior apparently wanted to see see it. Okay, see, so yeah, I couldn't. I remember there was something with Barty Crouch at the Quidditch Cup, but I, I had to look some stuff up for my chapter because I was like asking. I had all these question points, and I was like, wait, no, Randy, I'll answer later. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do people feel about Barty Crouch at this point as a character? I like him. Boring. I like that he can dress. I, I like that he knows how to dress like a mongol. I don't know why, but <laughs> it kind of makes him sound like Hitler, honestly. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's right. Not That's not what hard. I felt. <laughs> no. It's oh, not sorry, that hard man. to dress like a muggle. Like, come on. Like, that one guy is like, oh, I bought it in a muggle shop, and he's wearing, like, a dress. Uh, Archie. Archie. He's like, he likes he's to like I tight. like a fresh air down there. I don't blame him. Does that imply that wizards don't wear underwear? These are the real questions. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, Archie is the best. I, I sympathize with him greatly. Yeah, so with Bertie Crouch, it, it's interesting because I think the book is is supposed to make you... It's like the idea is that it doesn't want you to like him, but it wants you to like Ludo, which was why it was interesting that you mentioned that, that Matt, that you really were into Ludo, because I think the idea is that once you read through it, you kind of realize that Ludo is an asshole and Bertie is not as much. He does plenty of asshole things, obviously, but he has some nuance to his motivations that you don't necessarily see at the start. Yeah, I did not like Ludo while I was reading this, but I think it's because I forget what he does, but I, I know that it's there's something with a lot of money at the end of the book that Harry gets. I don't remember exactly what happens, but like I was just annoyed at him. I'm like, you're trying, like everyone is trying a little bit to try to blend in, and here you are just being a wizard. Like, you're a ministry official. Come on. See, put I, like that. I like that about him. I like that bravado. I like the I don't give a fuck. I'm having a good time. Like I know. feel bad for that muggle that has to be obliviated ten oh, times Mr. a day. Yeah, Mr. Roberts is gonna he's not gonna do well. Yeah. He could have come up with some kind of excuse. It's a convention. But, I mean he he's just grossly incompetent, right? That's what we kinda learn is that he just has no yeah. idea how to do his job properly. Yeah. And it puts people in danger. And eventually it and comes fact, out is what it's like concussions, right? Or like they obliviate these people too often. They're like yeah. whoops, maybe you shouldn't have done that. Oh yeah, the whole the obliviating of people is is actually one of the most ethically questionable things. That right, that's that's does. like mind rabies, right? Like you can't just take away someone's memories and then all of a sudden they they're missing pieces of time. That's fucked up. It is it is very fucked up for sure. I mean, I, I feel like I read Ludo more as like a like dorky, like kind of like a father figure. Like you know, he's that he's that sports guy. He's that douchey guy he's also like, he like in college and then it's been yeah downhill. <laughs> yeah exactly like he's just like your post post college bro like living it up maybe that's why i like him so much you guys got to get a little distance from college and then you'll be like <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's definitely the kind of character or the kind of person who gets promoted because people like him as opposed to his skill set. I a like lot how he's like, world. yeah, that woman's just stupid. She'll find her way around here back in like in September. She'll think it's June. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, job, that, that whole thing with Bertha Jorkins is so like everyone's like, you know, you should probably look for her. He's like, nah, she's dumb. Like, <laughs> so. So connected to Ludo, we have. Uh, Fred and George making this insane bet. Yeah, yeah. It just makes no sense at all. So, do you think there's collusion going on here? Like, what what is happening? With <laughs> they this? called up. They called up Victor Crumb. We're like, hey, listen. I, it's the only way it makes sense to me because on Crumb's side, this is like one of the biggest. Like, if this was in real life, it would be considered one of the biggest sports blunders ever to intentionally lose the World Cup. 
Yeah. Yeah. It, and like, like Rothstein and the White Sox. Maybe they or divined. Maybe they divined something when they were like, "Oh, this is what's going to happen." Like, can you that may have been a theory at some point? Can, can you even like bet in wizarding? Because you can't. You just you just you can just like scry or whatever to see what will happen. Well, like you maybe it's like a. Them. Maybe it's like a small investment. Like they talk to Crumb, they're like, "Hey, we got this wizard Weezes business coming up. Um, I've been knowing <laughs> I know you want your hands be. on some of that I for all the other speak players." English, like, <laughs> do you wanna do you wanna like lose the game so we can get all this money? And he's like, "Yeah, I think sure." He took a dive. Do you wanna throw your sure. career? <laughs> I think he did, but for some reason, people I still love Quidditch him. Even though just he did that. the rules suck. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they do. You know, they do. He probably maybe he That's, did the math wrong. Yeah. He probably forgot the score like J.R. Smith, let's be honest. I think that's what happened. No one gets that reference, but it's okay. <laughs> oh, I get it. Someone listening. He didn't know it could end in a tie. I guess that's what But well, what happened if it's tied? It just keeps, it just keeps going. It's like cricket. Again? They'll go for days. Wait, so if you catch no, the but, snitch but and it ends the in a tie, ends what happens? the game. Right. Effectively yeah. ends. So if you're 150 yeah. points down, you catch the snitch, it's just a tie, right? Then you yeah, do yeah. another game. I don't know. They love ties in Europe, so it's fine. Call up J.K. Rowling and ask her. <laughs> oh, I would if I could. Tweet at her. She'll I answer. Bet, yeah, tweet at her. I bet she'll retcon something. No. What? So it's interesting that Crumb is idolized to this degree. Like he's he's like the LeBron James of yep. this society. Basically, he's like the greatest phenom that ever exists. I like how he's still like still in school though. Like he still goes to school. He's just so yeah. good. Yeah. Why Honestly, that kind of tracks though? with like. An Eastern European. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of like, I feel like rereading this, I kind of felt like, oh, all these people are mentioned because we're going to see them later. Like, even, um, like, I don't know if maybe JK went back to this, like, around book five, but like, even the love goods are mentioned here. Yeah. Uh, I, which yeah. I thought was interesting. Um, they live near the Weasleys. They're one of the families that does. Do they actually, though? Like, yeah, they do because well, they yeah, go over to. The hell. Yeah. Oh, okay. When they go to Xenophilius's house in the seventh book, it's like right by them. Okay. And you and they say here that they were one of the people that might have come to this port key location. Yeah. But we didn't get to meet them yet. It's crazy to me that people can take off like two weeks of work to go to the World Cup because they have to get to their campsite two weeks in advance. <laughs> I don't think Xenophilius love good uh well let's just say I think he can uh work mobily. But yeah, just like we just, they we were, just talked about wizarding work and how much it does. I know, but they matter. were saying like the people, like basically the people that can't afford the good tickets have to take off two weeks yeah, it's of work. Kind of fucked up societal <laughs> comp- situation to go on. camp out. There's probably like a level of like living without pay that they can do as a wizard. Maybe I don't know. Well, it, a lot of this is interesting to me in terms of like in group employment being like very focused on. Because that, like, that makes a lot of sense to me in terms of, like, wizarding insularity. And there's just, like, certain communal organizations that you end up working in. And most people end up in the ministry. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, like, a lot of it falls into place for me in terms of, like, Molly being very insistent that the twins work for the ministry. And, you know, yeah. um, and just kind of like, oh, why does everybody know each other? Well, partly because... I mean, when, when, what's his face, um, asshole Diggory says, like, um, oh, is there, <laughs> are there any, yes, <laughs> um, he's like, oh, are there any more of us around here? And it's like, yeah, no, I, I know that feeling of being like, are there, is there anyone in your in-group in the area mm-hmm. that you yeah, are, like, true. already aware of? Also, has Sy- has J.K. Rowling not, like, thought about Sy- side-along apparition yet or something? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's also just maybe more dangerous, or there's there's some risk to it that there's not with a port key, and it probably doesn't work with. Big yeah, I, like I think that's why when she introduced all that, she she made it out that like some people never really get it down, and it's a little hard to take people with you. So port keys and all the other shit we've been using is legit because it's safer. Yeah. Yeah. I also always have to look up what plus fours are. What are those? I for, I forgot to look it up. When the uh, when the the wizard runs up to obliviate. Um, the guy he's wearing plus fours, which I guess is just like knickers of some <laughs> description. Attire. Oh, they're breeches. Yeah. That I never, extend uh, four inches below the knee. Lumbago, yeah. Apparently it's lower back pain, and I got it. 
Oh, they're 1986 sporting or 18 1860 sporting attire. Where the fuck yeah. did they find it's that? Like a thing you'd wear at a horse race or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I I kind of like Amos also. I just want to say. Yeah. Like, why do like like, you guys no, all hate him? I like his sure. bombastic. I mean, he is yes, but I like his like bombastic support of his son. I don't know. I just kind of like it. I don't know. Maybe I'm just clouded by the like my son. <laughs> Oh god. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just, it's so sad. <laughs> I just have memories of being like sick at home when I was in middle school and watching the fourth movie and just like crying in my bed. <laughs> Jesus. When he's like, no, "My son." <laughs> and then that cemented this as my favorite book. <laughs> I okay, I will say I don't love the four a lot there's a lot of stuff in this book that like kind of drives me crazy and like doesn't make sense to me and is weird especially once you get to like the map and who knows who where who is when and yeah all that um but i do i mean after like once we hit the third task i am like i'm obsessed with this book it's oh, yeah. incredible also it really ramps up yeah also though there is so much build up to fred and george's business <laughs> yes <laughs> that doesn't even happen until the next book yeah it takes a long time to make up your own business. Yeah, and and we'll get to this more in the next couple of chapters, but it does feel like they're emphasizing the Weasleys a lot more in this book. Fred and George and Ron is a big gets a big arc in this book, and just that as a as a thing, I think is is a is an intentional aspect of the plot that they're trying to explore here. Oh, Ron mm-hmm. gets to be a sulky little bitch too later exactly. on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll get to that. <laughs> is that his big, is that his big like, arc? Has some not good looks later on in the book. Oh, oh yeah. Very true. Yeah. Oh yeah, she hates Hermione. I forgot. Yeah. Because Hermione has to marry Ron. These are facts. Uh, anything else on these these three chapters before we move on? All right. So let us hit our final two chapters for the day, which are chapter nine and ten, the dark mark. Oh, oh, oh! Sorry, I did want to mention good. something about the Vila and their exclusive. Uh, oh my god! On the boys, <laughs> <laughs> they made me. Those made me so mad. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really? into the Vila. Oh yeah, when like Hermione wasn't affected. <laughs> and I mean, like... it does make sense that it's an Eastern European thing, and it also makes sense that they kind of like resemble, I guess, sirens um, in yeah. mythology. Yeah. But um, like, I was just like, Ugh, really, really, we have to. Do you what? What is the thinking? Do you think it's like stupid, like sexualizing things for no reason, or? No, I just don't like. I I, I don't like how like all the men seem to be like under a magical spell for like a moment in the book and it, like everybody was okay with it kind of sort of but i mean i i love how like um almost stereotypical the guys get like the one the referee's like flexing his muscles and shit yeah. he's, like trying to I impress the girls but I, I think it leads to one of the best pieces of, of uh parenting advice arthur weasley gives is like remember boys don't always trust a pretty face yeah <laughs> okay I mean, yeah. if it works for you. <laughs> yeah. I get I get why it's in here, because this is the book where, where she's kind of just, like, starting to step on the puberty gas and, and you know, increase that element of the story. Um, hashtag Ron and Hermione forever. Um, but, it, it, I mean, for one thing, like, it's it's extremely, like, heteronormative. <laughs> it's, just, it's just, like, only the boys. And Hermione's just, like, exclusively, oh. this is expecting the boys, nobody else. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something you can definitely say about, I think, all the books, though, right? Yeah, that's no, for sure. And it, look, it was written in, I guess, if it was published in 2000, it was written in 1999. Obviously, it was, like, a long time ago, 20 years. Um, but um, I'm not, like, I'm not, like, pounding on like i hate it but um that was just one it was just one thing that was like i don't know if you're gonna have like a metaphor for um i don't know libido or whatever like yeah. i i don't know does it have to be something that like actually makes bo- like makes boys act like idiots as opposed to you know like, i don't know maybe they should have had the leprechauns be super sexy and <laughs> <laughs> That would have been good. <laughs> All right, let's hit chapters 9 and 10. The Dark Mark and Mayhem at the Ministry, which Abby will be taking us through. 
Okay, so I'm going to read my summary then. It's four paragraphs. I'm sorry. So celebrations over the Irish victory at the Quidditch World Cup are cut short by the arrival of dark figures in cloaks and masks who have taken it upon themselves to have some celebrations of their own. Um, These festivities taking form of dangling helpless muggle families tens of feet in the air. Harry and the gang run for safety, but along the way, Harry realizes that he somehow managed to lose his wand. After a quick encounter with Draco Malfoy at the edge of the woods, the trio managed to make it to a clearing where they hear a deep voice cast the more... I can never say this, the Morse Mordor incantation, which sends uh, Voldemort's symbol into the sky. This causes the muggle baiters to leave and cause the attention of the ministry workers who find Winky holding Harry's missing wand standing where the symbol was cast. While it is evident that Winky did not cast the symbol, Crouch frees her for her disobedience. Uh, The trio then return back to the campsite with Mr. Weasley and head back to the burrow early the next morning. Harry learns what Death Eaters are and uh, what the Morse Mordor symbol means. They ponder over the logic of one of the Death Eaters casting the spell, seeing as those who managed to escape Escon would not be in Voldemort's favor if they if he were to return. Over the next week, the efficacy of the ministry is called into question by articles written by Rita Skeeter. Harry confines in Hermione and Ron that about his scar hurting just a few days before the World Cup and wordly awaits a letter from Sirius, hoping his godfather may be able to shed some light on the situation for some reason. And Ron and Harry also receive a set of dress robes um, for school. So uh, I feel like the second chapter is kind of a nothing chapter. So it's pretty much everything that happens in the the first one the dark mark chapter that is really important and i realized that half the questions i had are actually answered later in the book because i forgot (laughs) so let's do it it's like a quiz okay so my first one was who cast the marsh marja was it the death eaters or was it barty crouch jr because i honestly yeah honestly i couldn't remember um and then was the muggle baiting just for fun or was it a warning by the death eaters just for fun because they're dicks yeah (laughs) And then um, well, that, that's our... something that I, I think is worth talking about because I it's it's an interesting kind of manifestation of like different kinds of evil, right? Like yes. these are Death Eaters being like, haha, we're Death Eaters and we hate Muggles, so we're gonna torture Muggles and scare everybody. But once it becomes like actual Voldemort time, like they're like, oopsie, they're out of there because they yeah. still yeah. they don't want to like deal with the social consequences of. You know, they, they don't want to be in Azkaban. They want to live their bigoted lives, right. you know, among proper society. So, so I mean, this, these were, like, guys walking through with tiki torches, right? Like, <laughs> this, this yeah. was what was happening. They're proud equipment. boys. Yeah. yeah. Oh. But that means they, like, like, packed their stuff. Aren't they... you guys so happy that this is continually <laughs> relevant? <laughs> yes. It's great that we can have very recent <laughs> it's parallels. It's more relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's great, I mean, isn't it? But, like, does this mean that they, like, planned on doing this? or Because they, they had to have, like, packed all their, like, Death Eater stuff in their tents and were, like... Yeah, they had a meeting. Yeah. <laughs> and I, don't they like, all just have, like, a Death Eater bag of holding where it's just, like, all ready to go? And they're, like, we're going to get really drunk and have some fun tonight. They all have Hermione handbags. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's, so, it's strange that this is the first time this has happened if they are really maybe they really feel like they're safe from Voldemort or something at this point that they could a- begin acting out again well which book is it that uh, people are hexing toilets and the muggles are getting like sucked in or whatever or they're getting it exploded on yeah that, that seems more like the dumb next kids one, though. I think. because I feel no, like it, that, that kind of stuff especially against muggles like it might seem silly or whatever but still like you know aggressive acts of like sabotage yes. to yeah. you know to space bigotry. muggles it's bigotry yeah. yeah which is actually like to go back to the tongue tongue toffee thing like one of the reasons Arthur freaks out is because he's like well I you know spend all my time telling people not to mistreat muggles and then my own sons do this yeah. and they're like oh well we didn't do it to him because he's a muggle we did it to him because he's an asshole and it's like yeah but you're still doing something to him that he has like no way to defend against it's still like magical aggression against a non-magical person yeah. and yeah, the, yeah the there's, concept... a, there's a definite power difference like mm-hmm. Yeah, but the concept of of wizard muggle relations are is a very confusing thing, right? Because of the statute of secrecy, like there's there is a there's a desire by those in power to to prevent wizard muggle relations. That's something they don't want to happen unless absolutely necessary. So it's kind of a weird, complicated issue that's not as simple as we just need to be more cooperative with each other. There's this desire to hide from them that's so that's so strong. Well, it's sort of like it's I mean, I I do think that power dynamic is really interesting because the wizards perceive themselves probably rightly as being the 
more like being the minority, but being the more powerful minority. Um, And whereas they used to be in secret for their own protection at this point. And I think this is actually a good theme that is in uh, Fantastic Beasts because there are some in there. Um, But the idea that like, wait, why are we doing this? Like we're, you know, and, and it's something that Dumbledore, you know, deals with in, um, when, when he was meeting Grindelwald initially, that it's like, we're, we're more powerful. We can improve life supposedly like, why shouldn't we be in charge? And there's, I think a lot of different manifestations of the idea that like wizards should be more known and more powerful. Obviously like the most, like the darkest and most extreme is like the Voldemort school, which is like, you know, we sh- must subjugate and kill and blah, blah, blah. But I think that, you know, on that same scale is the idea is sort of like Fred and George's idea. And also the idea that like, Oh, well, you know, we're just like, it's like, you know, uh, noblesse oblige a little bit of, among wizards. Which I do kind of wish, I mean, it's, it's, you know, vaguely kind of stated with things like witch burnings and whatnot, but I wish there was more context for what the fear is that muggles would do. Like, there maybe there's some other event in history that, that really shaped this thinking. Yeah, especially because when the statute was enacted, the muggle technology would probably have, was, like, so weak, because it would make sense if now they were more terrified of muggles, because, like, they have all these... Um, like things that could actually overpower a wizard, but they don't know about any of that stuff now because they don't interact. Do, do with we? Them. I mean, there's that one witch that liked to be burned because she thought it felt funny. Like, I don't think there's anything <laughs> yeah. that we could really throw at them that would really like. I, can know, we just? It, we could nuke them. Well, that's what Grindelwald <laughs> says in the second movie, but that's just stupid. I'm just saying we could nuke well, them. Well, I mean, bullets well, are probably the big really. thing you would think of, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, a wizard would have like, to always be on guard, and yeah, I guess so. But I mean, I, I figure like they could just do like a cone of protection kind of thing. And also, I was wondering, kind of on the same topic, are the freed Death Eaters still loyal to the cause, or um, like, are they afraid of Voldemort? Like, do they go back to him because they're afraid of him, or are they actually loyal to the cause? It's complicated, right? I think that they are of the opinion that Voldemort is gone at this point. Uh, and I think they definitely, I mean, I think part of being a servant of Voldemort is fearing him, but I think they, they clearly want what Voldemort wants. They're they're tied to his motives in that way, but they're not like a true believer, mm-hmm. like that that they would they would steadfastly follow Voldemort through all the the times where he's not powerful, like, like Barty Crouch Jr. supposedly is. But Bar- Barty Crouch Jr. organized this, right? I mean... No, he... Not the he, Death Eaters, Yeah, though. he organized the... Oh. the Morris Murdo to to scare the Death Eaters, according to Harry Potter Wikipedia. Because <laughs> I he's, he's for all intents and purposes working against them yeah. in that way. I forgot what least. happened. <laughs> well, which is you know again, it's it's interesting to me how like you know when the shit hits the fan at the end of the book, like you have people falling to kind of like one side or the other. You know, you have the Death Eaters who Voldemort like kind of agrees to take back into the fold, even though they were they were doing this kind of thing and like you know i don't know could you call them a, a dino a death, death eater name only or something um but like you know but then you have other people who don't make the cut and have you know have rejected like may still hold the like the anti-muggle ideology but haven't like put their money where their mouth is um and obviously that's all like aided and abetted by the ministry being idiots and stuff It, it helps a lot of things along <laughs> throughout these books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, I think the dark mark itself is kind of an interesting thing to look at for a second, just because it really is a good example of the power that symbols can have um, when, when, you at, when you load them with this kind of context. And I like how when you first see it through the eyes of Harry or Ron or whatever, they, they just don't think it. They're like, what is that? It's not important. But if you were someone who lived through that moment, it's such a completely different reaction when you see that it's it's this feeling of just pure horror that that you have when you see that and I love that as an idea and I think that's explored here it's just the, the that when you load a context or a symbol with context it, it completely changes the meaning mm-hmm. um and then I, I don't do we want to get into house elf and magical creature rights or has that been done for book 2 
Well, it's 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 a it's a theme of this book, right? Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. kind of get the first the spew. first real moments of that here. It's spew this book. I thought it was book two. It's this book. Oh, okay. Book. Yeah, this is like uh, the whole like wizard. Uh, or I'm sorry, um, house elf like subplot where Hermione okay. like forms a club of house. For, okay, I thought like, that was the second book. Yeah. But. And Winky gets. Yeah, this a, book is where we learn that the food. Yeah, Winky just becomes show a drunk. Up. There's like a <laughs> bunch of slaves that make it show up. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, yeah, oh. I kind of like. I, I love that, though, because I think in a lot of different ways, we have this kind of innocent image of the world mm-hmm. and what it's like in earlier books. But in all these different ways, the, the curtain is pulled back of how these different social um, dynamics are working, not just with, you know, obviously oppressed different races like house, el- house elves, but also, of course, with muggles. And also, financially, we see a lot more yeah. clearly here with with the things that happens with Ron and just the, the effect of being someone who doesn't have the same kind of access that, that someone like Harry does or a lot of other people do. And I, just all these things get shared at the same time. And I think that that's part of the reason why it's such a good progression of the narrative. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that because her, Hermione has the perspective like these people are slaves because she has the muggle background. And it's I think it's very interesting that the wizards don't see it that way because like they don't have the the history of what the muggles do with like you know enslavement and stuff and i just think that's very interesting but in this case they are not people they are elves but they're sentient creatures it's that's true the whole argument especially cuz it's interesting cuz um we learned that magical creatures that aren't wizards aren't allowed to have wands and is yeah, that that's to kind of fucked up. is that to like oppress their magic so that they they can't be stronger than wizards? Is it? Yes, because <laughs> they because they, they obviously would yeah, they think 100%. that Winky cast the charm. So obviously we know that wands can be used by non wizard magical creatures. So I just think it's really interesting that um, I don't know. I just think it's interesting that Hermione is the only one that cares. Like Harry doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Mm. Well, something that um, the goblins are particularly upset mm-hmm. about. Yeah, um, I you know the, I don't I don't know if I I don't love the way the goblin thing wraps up in Deathly Hallows, but there's a lot of interesting stuff about like the like excuse goblin me wars. why the fuck why the fuck should we help you like you people are like literally you know keeping us under under you deliberately yeah. with this wa- ban on using wands and. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting that that's one of the first or, or long term or something like that goals that Hermione actually ends up having for SPEW. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all very complicated because they're, I don't think, I don't think you should look at it without being like, this is a magical story and these are magical creatures who, to some extent, seem to have, for lack of a better word, like servitude in their yeah. psyche. You know. It's internalized to such an extreme. Yeah, yeah I, but I don't. I don't know if, and maybe it'll come out and you know expanded universe Pottermore stuff. But it seems like the house elves only in England are like the house servants. I don't know if that's something to do with like the you know the stratification of English society into this like servant class and lords and you know stuff like like Downton Abbey kind of shit. Because what we see in Fantastic Beasts, the movies, is that they're pretty on equal footing. Like, you know, they just have their own jobs that they're doing. And, you know, they're not necessarily serving or devoted to a family like they are in England. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is so complicated, right? We get that kind of idea here that, that we also get in the Saga of Ice and Fire. Like when Daenerys frees the slaves, they kind of lose their purpose and their station in life, which in some ways actually is harmful to them. And we see that here. Kind yeah. Of, we see that with Winky. That, that, at least it's yeah, Winky and, and, and Dobby and all this kind of stuff that we also get, which is, yeah, it's a nuanced, complicated issue that it's cool that it, it can happen. in these yeah. Dobby now wants minimum wage and everyone's like, no way. And Winky, yeah, Winky doesn't know what to do. She's, she becomes like drunk, right? That's all she does. Is she hangs out yeah. in the Hogwarts kitchens yeah. and drinks. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dobby's really complicated too, because Dumbledore actually offers him like more money and more time off. And more like, time oh off. no yeah. no, no no! Oh, that's too much. Yeah. yeah. Um. So it's interesting, and then you know, it's and it's like, where does it come from? Is it like inherent, or is it like like conditioned in them, or is it like right? You know, um. There's you know, and then there's creature who is also very dedicated to to this system, but you know, objects to the people that he has to carry it out for, and but still won't necessarily right. break that. It's yeah. 
Yeah, oh, and how he became the way he is because of just the sheer abuse that he's taken. Mm-hmm. Right, and then the yeah. solitude, like. <laughs> but I think uh, I think as far as a magical creature goes, uh, like the elves might be like something like um, Tolkien's dwarves or something, just like a, a creature that wants to work and needs to work to feel like productive. And they've kind of created, you know, like you said with creature, like he hates having to serve the the masters he eventually serves, but he does it anyway. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I also just like it because I I appreciate how different like a lot of what Rowling does is very in in fairy tale canon sort of and in like English mm. lore canon um but the elves are quite different um and like cuz they're obviously extremely different from Tolkien's elves and they're also yeah. not the like you know mischief mischievous demon sprites of like English fairy tale lore and stuff um so so I like the idea that she's kind of playing with these very, like she keeps them extremely powerful, but she puts them in a very different position socially. Um, I wonder if that's to like foil um, some of the wizards desire for power, where like we could see that the elf magic is stronger than wizard magic at times. And they just don't seem to want to act on that. Whereas like the goblins, like you said, like, want to act on them and have acted out violently in the past. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is where we start to like, I mean, well, we, we started with, I think, um, werewolves in the last book, but like, by the, like she, she, she makes that metaphor like physical in the next book with the fountain of, um, wizarding magical equality or harmony. Or yeah, something like light, that. That whole thing. yeah. Which is total BS, you know, and, and, like Harry notices that it's total nonsense, even as he's looking at it. Um, but it's really interesting that like wizarding society is, it is structured on this idea that like of, of supremacy, um, yeah. which is, I think in some way or a reaction to the fact that like on some level, they must know that elves are stronger than they are, that goblins yeah. probably have stronger magic than they do. That, like, a fear aspect to it. Well, you yeah. get the, the next book, you get the centaurs and you, or maybe did you already meet? The, do, do they meet the centaurs in the first book? I honestly, I forgot. Yes, yeah. they do. But yes. but you you learn like they're pretty powerful, and they just they just want to be left alone, you know. So there's also that too. Or- but I, I mean, I think it's also worth just re- repeating that like they have a department for the regulation and control of magical creatures, mm-hmm. and like mm-hmm. these creatures are, you know, like that would maybe make sense if you're talking about a creature like Buckbeak or you know. Uh, whatever Correct. whatever Newt's got in his case, you know. But when you're talking about sentient, like, like I, I remember, I don't know if anyone has read the Temeraire series um, by Naomi Novik, but this was, like, one of the, like, earlier times in my reading experience that I came across this, like, differential between, like, sentient beings who aren't human. And I remember she said something once that, like, they're, they're not human, but they are people. And it's the same thing here like goblins and yeah. elves and and centaurs are people um they just are also not human um so yeah i mean i i i don't like i don't think um i think a lot of it gets lost in like harry potter discussion because like she definitely doesn't nail the landing on a lot of these issues um but i still think that they're like present in the books and are it's clear that she cares about them and it's important to discuss them you know when when they're raised so yeah and i think at the end of the day she wasn't writing some kind of social action series but right. wasn't she because the the whole conflict is between the muggleborns and the the purebloods which is over like who has a right to call themselves a wizard I mean, I think I think one of the main theses of Harry Potter is anti prejudice, mm-hmm. and she tackles that for sure. Along a whole lot of different vectors, and sometimes that gets I think pulled off effectively. Like I do think that the Muggleborn thing is resolved effectively. Um, I don't think that the anti prejudice message necessarily with like the house elves um, is resolved 100 or particularly the goblins really because the house elves it's a little more ambiguous because you have creature kind of kicking ass at the end which is nice but like um <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about the the goblins um 
being resolved as effectively or even the centaurs. But, um, but I, and that's what I keep coming back to, you know, when I, when I think about like the ideas that are at work in the series, because I think, I think she does, she is writing politically in that, in that sense that she is stating very clearly that like prejudice and, and, um, division and segregation and, um, legal, legal mistreatment that people consider normal are, is not okay. And, you know, that's, that's, I think the baseline of the series. And I think that's why people keep going back to it or one of the big reasons why people keep going back to it. Cause like, I, if this wasn't about anything, I don't think, I think like this did definitely comes after these books were written, but um, I'm reminded of like Doctor Who with the Ood characters. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers them. They are the uh, aliens that hold basically they hold their heart to some extent, but they are also servants slash slaves to humans in the future. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I, I wonder. I feel like this kind of this might be a bit tropey rather than like JK being like, Oh, I want social political uh, things to be in the books. (laughs) Well, I think she's definitely taking trying to make it political with the um, SPEW movement, but it it's done as kind of, because it's such a side plot and it not really prevalent beyond like hair, you know, it's like kind of a SPW is kind of a joke. Like it's literally, you know, it's spew. Like it's it's a joke. But I think she's trying to make a statement, but she doesn't want it to be the main focus of because she has a, a story that she wants to tell at the same time. Yeah, I never felt that it was it was preachy or anything like that, or that that was the intention. I feel like it's all it all connects and and is logical in the world. And it's all constructed in a way that makes sense and follows and is in a lot of ways relatable to, to our own situation. So I don't think that there's anything about that. It's like trying to force a message upon you or that it doesn't suit what, what the story is or that the world is. Yeah. I mean, we come at this from the very beginning with Harry being in, in like straddling that experience of being like muggle raised, but wizard born and in a position of huge privilege because he is wealthy and also, Uh, is Harry Potter, but also has no idea what's going on in the world and isn't scared of Voldemort's name because he hasn't been trained to. And, you know, um, I, I think that it's always there definitely gets emphasized much more strongly as the books go on. Um, And I think we can talk more about spew and like Hermione's tactics versus what might actually work. And like, to what degree like spew is a joke versus Hermione's, recognition of the problem um because i don't think hermione's recognition of the problem is actually ever considered a joke i think why don't we talk I, about that when she develops it exactly so yeah. I'm, so we'll just we'll just find <laughs> that right there <laughs> yeah perfect that in, is the six perfect months later. <laughs> exactly so I think that is a good place to end. This was a this was a fantastic discussion. Thank you all so much for joining me for this and making this happen. Of course, always love talking Harry Potter, and I'm excited that we are getting to these books where we can talk about all these ideas. I think, like I said, I I just think the books get better and better. And so Zach, to... keeping this under two hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm impressed. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all so much again. Uh, before we wrap up, is there any other podcasts coming up that people want to shout out? Uh, I think we have a reread coming out pretty soon. It's been shelved, but I just saw that the most recent one was posted. So I think Adam has it. Adam? Yeah, the last part of the, the Feast recap just went up. So um, in a couple of days, the next, the continuation of the reread will go up. It will probably so. be out before this podcast. Yeah. Most likely. And I know uh, uh, Mind Hunter Season 2 wants to record still, and we just haven't pinned down a time, but that's something that we want to do. Exciting. Yeah, I'm planning to do a podcast on the latest book by Joe Abercrombie, which, if you're not familiar, is just another fantasy author. Uh, I've got some people that seem to be down for that, so that'll be happening once that book is out and we have a chance to read it, which should be later this yeah, month, and, early October. Um, the Amazon series, The Boys, I think we're still trying to oh, yeah. get yeah, that I wanna, together. I want to talk about that. Well. I need to watch that show. It sounds like it's good. Oh, I, gave, so- I gave up on it in episode three because I, I didn't like any of the characters at all like i just couldn't i couldn't latch on <laughs> as i really? as i said to greg i don't need this right now 
So <laughs> I decided just to re- I get that for sure. Yeah, I just decided to rewatch Umbrella Academy instead because there are likable characters in that one. <laughs> Was there ever a VOK on the Americans? I don't think so. Oh, fuck. No, we just like one of the best shows the last decade. I know, for sure. man. Maybe I'll, yeah. I'll put up a CTA to see. What that and kind of how it reframes the the uh, the whole Soviet conflict a little bit for us. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. All righty, cool. Well, thank you all again. And thank you everyone so much for listening. If you want to check out more on VOK, you can do so at VOKpodcast.com. And you can check us out on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on all of the things. Uh, and you can also come chat with us on the podcast of Ice and Fire Forum, which is very easy to find. Thank you all again, and we'll be back again very soon. Yeah. Yo, the fucking Weasleys are like feral people, right? Like, the, no! I was getting anxiety, like during, the, like they're using the tables to fight each other with. Like, what are, what, what's going on in that house? I mean, six they're boys. Make, they're so. making explosions in the room. I didn't think that was that bad. <laughs> That's actually a line I love. Like, oh, yeah, we've been hearing explosions from Fred and George's room forever. (laughs) It's just, like, normal life. (laughs) I was so confused when Harry was like, I'd never seen Charlie or Bill before. And I was like, you met Charlie when he gave the dragons. But then I remember that was this book. So... (laughs) (laughs) It just reminds me of the fact that Bill doesn't show up until the last movie. Really? He doesn't show up at all until then. (laughs) But, like, I'm so... Is it... Is he not in the fourth movie when he meets Fleur? Because like oh, his don't... wedding is his wedding is in the last movie. He's in um he the Seven up. Potters. No, yeah, he has... the second. The second. No, he, he shows up in the sixth when he gets um when nope. uh in the books. Does, nope. Oh, it doesn't happen. In the, the the fucked up thing is that that he shows up scarred by Fenrir Greyback <laughs> in the seventh movie, but that doesn't happen in the sixth movie. No, it sure doesn't. I'm, I'm so happy with my choices. Yeah. I liked how it was uh, Mad Eye's son that they got to play the actor Donald Gleason. Oh yeah, was cool. I just like he, Harry's like Bill was so cool. Because you had a cool earring, man. <laughs> he looked like a fang. Yeah, fang and long hair. I just it doesn't it doesn't sound like something a British person would say to me. Like I can't picture a British person just being like, "Wow, they're so cool." I He's feel like so they would use a, wizard. <laughs> like they would just so use fetch. a funnier a funnier word. This was supposed to take place like in so the mid '90s, anyway. So, like, yeah, that's they would. Yeah, they'd be cool, like, he's man. so cracker. So cracker. But, yeah, that's what they say on Dairy Girls, and that takes place in the '90s. I, I lived in the '90s. I, no one said cracker unless you're referring to a white guy. <laughs> no, in 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 Ireland, that's what they say in Dairy Girls. They're like, oh, he was so cracker, or this is so cracker. Yeah, he's so cracker, man. <laughs> is that Jamaican? I don't know what accent that was. I don't know. I have no idea what that was at all. Oh, 38 minutes before Adam did an accent. <laughs> That's a new record. How dare you? <laughs> um, well, Where this does... pu- book was published in July of 2000, which I remember because I was in a very, very religious sleepaway camp. Well, and I was, was this a, a band year book there? in. It was was actually not, but they did discuss it. They were like, I've heard that there are some, like, girl-boy things in this book, but we're not going to be Harry Potter. Girl-boy things. Inappropriate. Uh, Hardly inappropriate. Yes. Abby, where were you in 2000? Um, I was a year old, so I was probably... I was was starting my first year of college. (laughs) What was I doing when I was a year old? I don't know. My brother used to dress me up. As a cowboy, okay. <laughs> and like put like football helmets on me, but put them the wrong way. God damn it! Just trying to protect your head. <laughs> Where does Bill rank on the hottest Harry Potter characters? Isn't he like I one of the hottest? The hottest. He, yeah, he he's like the people. hottest. Yeah, yeah I think for men, I think. I think Bill is supposed to be like the hottest Harry Potter character. Well, he he he, he has to be because he gets Fleur. So yeah, exactly. Same. Well, she likes him for more than his per- his looks because after he gets mauled by Fenrir Greyback, she still likes him. Oh no, I know that's like one of my favorite scenes in the whole series. But I'm just saying, like it <laughs> definitely it. seems like Fleur is like he is handsome enough for me. <laughs> and then she throws in a little jab to English cooking about how they over always overcook <laughs> for me. Anyways, hi, is, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Sorry. Is Bill the hottest Harry Potter character? Yeah, this is an important question. I mean, 
Yeah. <laughs> and what were you doing in two thousand? He has a really cool earring. Oh, back at, back then, I thought Harry Potter was the hottest. So. <laughs> The problem is Cedric's described as really good looking, but on the cover of the American Isn't version, he, he is not good, good looking. looking. He's so cute. No, I think he's so cute on the cover. Yeah. I don't yeah. like it. <laughs> I don't like this 17 year old boy. 